Okay, to discuss the U.S. economy, Peter Schiff is on the show. Peter is the CEO of Euros Pacific Capital, also the host of the Peter Schiff Show. Peter recently wrote about weak retail sales data, and he said that the weather would likely be used as an excuse. So I first asked him why the weather argument is so often used as a crutch to explain weakness in the economy, and here's what he had to say. No, it's about excuses. First they said, oh, people aren't shopping because it's too cold. Now they're saying it's because it's too warm. I mean, it has to be just right. What is the ideal shopping weather? You know, I, I, it, this, this is all a way to rationalize the fact that the consumer doesn't have the means to shop because he doesn't have the income, he doesn't have the savings, he just can't afford to buy stuff. This is what is going on, and this is going to continue despite all the rationalization and all the excuses. The, the U.S. economy is going to continue to experience a contraction, you know, in, the, in real terms, because we are not a, a productive economy anymore, and we're still living off of credit. But once you have you know, too much debt, you can't keep on spending money. And then when you've lost your full-time job and all you've got to replace it is a lower-paying part-time job, you've got to cut back on all the extras. You know? And you don't need new clothes. You, know, you can get by without, you know, without buying uh, apparel. And that's why you're seeing it in these types of uh, you know, stores. This is the discretionary spending that is going away. Yeah, but just on your comment about, you know, people spending because they're broke. I mean, a lot of people would challenge that and say they are spending just not in the traditional places, not in the big box department stores, because recent data uh, did show that the amount of shoppers uh, spent, the amount that shoppers spent online in October continued to rise 7.1 percent higher than October of last year. So is the story here really more about changing consumer habits? Not really, because the percentage of shopping that takes place online is still relatively small. And so even though you're seeing bigger increases there, it's not making up for the difference. You know, the, the, the brick and mortar retailers are losing a lot more than the online retailers are gaining. So the net effect is that you're, you're, you're seeing a reduction. Okay, I want to go back, circle back to uh, talking about the Fed rate hike. Um, because in a, in a commentary piece on your blog, you say the markets won't be able to handle a rate hike. How do you know that to be the case when we haven't even seen that happen yet? Well, that's one of the reasons the Fed has been so reluctant to raise rates. I mean, why do you think they've been at zero for seven years? If the Fed thought the markets could handle higher rates, it would have delivered higher rates years ago. Uh, it certainly would have been appropriate to have done that. So I think the Fed is, is cognizant of this risk. But also, if you look at the enormity of the debt that we have, the only reason that we can afford it is because rates are at zero. And so any increase in interest rates will increase the burden of servicing that debt. And the economy is already slow. This has been the weakest recovery in history, despite 0% interest rates. So imagine what would happen to this weak recovery if it had to contend with rates that were higher than zero. Yeah, exactly. And I think what you're referring to, I haven't heard you say it, is the shadow rate, which you explore in this piece. Talk to me about uh, that a little bit more. Where did this notion of a shadow rate come from? How is it determined? Yeah, people don't realize that the Federal Reserve began tightening a long time ago, right? First, they started talking about tapering, and then they actually tapered, right? And then they actually tapered to zero. And then they began talking about raising interest rates. So taking away the quantitative easing and their forward guidance comments, that was an effective tightening. And if you look at what happened to monetary conditions as a result of this prior Fed action and the prior Fed rhetoric, this shadow rate has moved up rather significantly. And so I think the Federal Reserve has already been tightening for close to two years, despite the fact that the official rate is still at zero. And you have a lot of people talking about how, well, you know, we don't have to worry about the effects of higher interest rates because the market doesn't no normally turn down until 12 months to 24 months after the first rate hike and the economy doesn't usually go back into recession uh, there's some kind of a lag but if you actually realize that the fed has been tightening for 18 19 months by the time they actually get around to raising rates if they actually do it in december uh, the markets and the economy are very vulnerable based on historic precedent to that move because it's not the beginning it's 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 19 months into the tightening cycle
Yeah. Now, I want to be clear about what you're talking about here, this, the forward guidance that we're getting um, from the Fed, which you say plays a huge role. Are you saying that the Fed overtly talking about tightening or loosing has in some ways done more damage than actually doing it? Well, well not damage isn't the word, but it tightens monetary conditions. I mean, look at how much the dollar has gone up based on the talk of higher U.S. interest rates. Rates haven't gone up at all. Yet the dollar has had a huge rise because of the Fed's commitment to actually raise rates. So that has an effect of tightening. Also, you can look at the, the markets, the, the, the money markets that price in the probability of a rate hike. Mortgage rates have already backed up now based on the fact that the Fed is talking about raising interest rates. So the Fed has affected the rate curve simply with its rhetoric without actually having to do anything. So the market has been tightening conditions. Now, conditions are not tight. Historically, they're still loose, but they're not as loose as they used to be. And it's the change that's important, especially when you have an economy so deeply indebted as ours. There is no precedent in American history for having so much debt. So, yes, interest rates have never been this low, but the debt overhang has never been this huge. And I believe even a small increase in interest rates will be enough uh, to collapse the economy because we can't even service our debt at a higher rate of interest, let alone ever pay it off. Yeah, and, and you sort of just answered my next question, which is, you know, first of all, under that logic, what happens when a rate, a rate hike does come into play, and, and does it make a difference how small that hike is? Well, I mean, I think the Fed is going to try to backtrack, uh, just like it did when it initially uh, tapered. It started talking about a considerable period and, uh, you know, before we raise rates. And so I think they're going to have similar language if they end up raising rates in December. And I still think it's uh, more likely that they won't. But if they do, I think they're going to try to take the sting out of it as best they can by talking about how long they're going to wait before they do it again how it's going to be a considerable period or whatever they're going to say. They're going to be monitoring the economy. Uh, they're going to be very careful, which in and of itself is an admission of the fragility of this economy. If raising rates by a quarter of a point gives them so much concern that they have to stop back and assess the damage and make sure that the economy can withstand it before they raise them another quarter of a point, 